On the phone right now, Andrew Ross Sorkin, who writes for the New York Times, wrote the great book, Too Big to Fail, which was made into a movie by HBO with a star-studded list. I mean, unbelievable actors in this movie. Here's a little taste of, uh, of what the movie Too Big to Fail is about on HBO. We can all argue about how we got here. We're all responsible. It's a catastrophic mess. The risk managers lost control. Goldman and Morgan Stanley are going down now. My missionary is already here. We're in it. You can't just hand the banks piles of cash. And what do I say? When they ask me why it wasn't regulated. Main Street wants Wall Street to pay. 35,000 jobs just disappeared in this city. Gotta start stacking sandbags. I just lost $90 million. Personally. Gripping stuff. It is a <laughs> great movie, and it was a fantastic book. Uh, Andrew, good morning. How are you? Good morning to you. Thank you for having me. Uh, did the movie meet your expectations? Oh, my God. It probably blew away my expectations. As a, as a book writer, when you're sitting there, there toiling in the middle of the night writing a book, and then you hear that it's going to be made into a movie, you're worried that Hollywood's going to totally screw it up. But, right. but it totally uh, exceeded the expectations in terms of just the story and the pace and, and then, of course, the actors. I mean, It's getting high marks because a lot of people have looked at it and said, this is a fairly balanced account of what happened. It's, it's not a hit piece. Well, that's what I, you know, that's what I really like about the film, and and hopefully like about the book, which is that it really just lays out the facts and try, tries to tries to bring you sort of in a, the way Bob Woodward's done before, try to bring you inside the room so you can actually see what what the choices were and what the decisions that were made. And it's not a political piece. It's not it's not trying to tell you that this was a uh, you know uh, a Democrat problem or a Republican problem. It's just this is what they were con- confronting. This is and 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 tells you how we got here. But it's not it's not you're right. It's not it's not supposed to sort of it's not like inside job. I, I read your book and I remember reading it. It was a thriller and I couldn't put it down. How did you get the CEOs of those companies, the people on the inside, and the people at the Treasury Department? to give you those quotes and to tell you exactly what was going on? Because this isn't just, you know, paraphrasing. You were, you were quoting these people. How, how, how did that you know, happen? I think, when I, I'll be, be honest, when I first started the project, I was scared out of my mind that I'd never get everybody to participate. I think one of the things that happens as, as you dig into a project like this is uh, more and more people start to talk to you, and the more and more people that talk to you, uh, then the folks that haven't talked to you start saying to themselves, you know what, this guy is talking to all these other people, and they're talking and they're telling him stuff. Maybe I should talk, too. And I think ultimately that's what happened. It was one of those situations where probably the first third probably did talk to me for, for the right reasons. I probably had a, a third of the people talk to me for all the wrong reasons, you know, a group that wanted to spin and rewrite history and all that. And my job was to keep them honest. But then there's always that last third that doesn't want to talk at all. But when they realize that the first group, the first two groups have, have already spent time with you, they say, oh, my God, maybe I should actually play ball. So it's, a, it's sort of a chicken and egg kind of thing. Well, there's some disparate opinion on, like, how close were we really to having the whole thing just crash down on us mm-hmm. at that time before TARP was passed um, as a guy so close to it who's had this, you know, this movie come to fruition to a huge audience now. What's your take on that? How close were we? How scared were you when you started investigating this? Oh, I think we were we were on the edge of economic abyss, if, if that's even a, a word or a phrase, you know. And I would say, by the way, you know, I was writing about this in real time for the New York Times. But at the time, I don't even think I understood. I'm not sure any of us understood how bad it was at that time. Right. It was actually probably only once I got into the book that I realized really what, what was really going on and, and how I think we were looking at something. And I think Hank Paulson's come out and said it, but others have said it, too. I think we were looking at 25 percent unemployment in this country. And I mean, so you- people look around and say, oh, we're living in sort of 9, 10 percent unemployment world today. And that's bad. And I don't want to suggest it's not. I think we, we, we have to look at it in relative terms to what, what could have been. You know, Andrew, in so much of the reporting that goes on out there, there's a lot of hand-wringing. Oh, isn't this horrible? Look, look at how bad this was. And we don't ever get to sort of the, the, the more important thing is, what is the lesson that we should walk away with? What is our walk away on this as you look back on everything that you know now? What should we walk away? What should we think about going into the future? I think there's there's two big lessons. Uh, one is that, that this crisis, as all financial crisis crises, was really a result of one thing, which is debt, debt leverage, whatever, whatever word you want to use, um, and that you can have as many bad actors doing as many bad things around the stage. You can have regulators not minding the stores. You can have bankers going wild. You can have credit rating agencies. But as long as you don't have enough debt in the system, the debt is 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 the match that lights the fire. 
And so we need to we need to we need to think about that long and hard. Um, and by the way, you know, too big to fail. We, we used to talk about that in the context of financial institutions. Now we talk about it in the context of municipalities mm-hmm. and states and countries. Mm-hmm. So there's sort of a, a, a larger, longer term lesson to think about. And then there's the politics of all of this. Um, you know, um, we didn't bail out Lehman Brothers. We didn't. Uh, you know, it, it became so unpopular to to, to do anything to, to save our system. But ultimately, I would actually argue that the failure of Lehman Brothers is what tipped tipped the balance. And, and the question is, in the future, uh, when there is another crisis, and by the way, there will be, uh, even, even though you know, we'd like there not to be, and even though we have some new legislation and all that, there will be. Uh, you know, when, when, when it becomes a political issue and we have to make some hard decisions, you know, are we going to make the decision that's popular or are we going to make the decision that's right? And I think that's actually going to be all right, there are two things, most challenging. Two things that caught my attention, well, one reading the book and the other watching the movie. That number one is when when Jeff Immelt, the head of uh, of GE, called up Paulson and said, "We we can't make payroll." Right. I mean that that's unbelievable. When the head of General Electric says we're not going to be able to make payroll. Yeah, absolutely. And and by the way, there were you know we didn't have it in it's in the book, but not in the movie. There was another scene where you know one of the largest McDonald's franchisees was calling up saying that he was worried that he wasn't going to be able to make payroll. So you know, GE, GE. By the way, you know, we think of GE as a light bulb company. Half that company had turned into something called GE Capital, which is almost like a bank. Yeah. And so, so it was infecting the rest of their business. Um, but this was going to impact, you know, everybody. And we often talk about it as a Wall Street problem, and I get that. Um, but I think people often miss the, the connection, and it often feels disconnected. Yeah. I, I also get that because you, you watch the, you know, bonuses in Wall Street get better after the crisis, and the rest of the economy doesn't seem to keep up. So. There, 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 are, there are inherent problems there, but I, I do think that Wall Street was fundamental to, to keeping the economy going. The other thing is, is Hank Paulson was so worried that the whole financial world was about to go down on his watch that he was literally throwing up in the right. toilet. <laughs> wow. No, no, absolutely. And, and I, I remember when I first heard that anecdote from, from somebody who was in the room, and I said, wow. I mean, that, that to me was actually when it, when it hit me about how, how bad things were. I, I I think people, you know, we all knew it was bad in September 2008. We knew it, but I don't think we knew really how bad it, it, it was and what the other side of the cliff looked like. So when you think about 25% unemployment or you think about GE or McDonald's or some of these uh, kind of things, I mean, that, that's to me the way we have to think about this in the right perspective, and it, it's very hard. And may I just say, a stroke of genius, Ed Asner as Warren Buffett. <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant. He did, a, he did a great job. They I all did a great job. I didn't realize I mean, how much those guys leaned on Buffett, though. I mean, he, he was like their go-to guy all the time. He, he was their Yoda. Oh, yeah. no question. I mean, any time there was a problem, you, you call Buffett. Because, by the way, he was one of the few people on the planet who had the money to do anything. So you, you were calling him for his advice, but you were also calling him because you wanted his dough. Yeah. All right. Well, before we let you go, Dick Fold, who was the CEO of Lehman Brothers, um, obviously was was riding that ship, and he didn't want it to go down. And at, at the end of the day, it, it filed for bankruptcy. What is he doing today? You know, he, he he has a small consulting firm, two or three people, has a little office. I actually, you know, I don't know how much business they do. Really, I'm not sure they do much business. He um, and he spends a lot of time doing that, and spends a lot of time on his legal issues. I mean. Uh, there's there's all sorts of civil litigation that's still going on, and always worries about criminal and and, uh, and SEC. Uh, well, nobody's filed anything against him, but boy, if his lawyer's been uh, working overtime to to make sure that doesn't happen. So um, he's an interesting character because he's somebody who believes to the bitter end. Mm-hmm. So uh, he, he, you know, in an odd way, I think the movie depicts him as the villain of the piece. But, yeah. Uh, he's someone who had a billion dollars of stock in his company and wrote it down to $56,000. And I think about that all the time because I think about compensation and what we need to do to incentivize people to make the right decisions. And then I think about Dick Fold, and it's, it's, um, he was somebody who, who always thought there was one more card to play and one more trade to make. Right. Andrew, great to have you on the program. Congratulations on the book and the hey, movie. It's fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor, yeah. really. Right, Andrew Ross Sorkin, financial columnist for New York Times, wrote the book Too Big to Fail that you can watch on HBO. Uh, it was it aired on the 23rd, but you can catch it on On Demand. You know how HBO is. It, they replay it like every other day. And it, it really is a fantastic movie, and you should watch it if you want to learn what the heck happened in 2008 in the 